Um, so this is yeast. Um, my microbiologist is, uh, all microbiologists are a little cuckoo. Um, but the way we explain it is the yeast is eating the sugars, it's farting out CO2 and pissing out alcohol. Um, and if you really look at them in a microscope long enough, um, we're basically feeding on them Thanksgiving dinner and they're reproducing on Thanksgiving dinner table. And you feed them again and they're just redoing it on the table. Um, that's how microbiologists view it and it's basically what's happening. Um, here's a chart that was in Owen's slide that blows my mind away. I'm not scientific, I'm very culinary. Um, so I will not explain it to you. I just wanted to show you how in depth and how scientific you can go with beer. Um, you guys take chemistry, you understand what's happening. Basically putting glucose in and it's converted up to ethanol on the top. I'm sure Gavin went over all that fun stuff. So these are ales versus lagers. Um, ales are gonna to be top or warm fermented. That's where we get a lot of ester profiles fermented faster. In lagers, the yeast is, is uh, bottom fermented and cooler. Doesn't mean the yeast is down here really. They can be fermenting all in the whole entire tank. Um, they're flocculating around, they're kind of circling the whole tank, but generally they like to hang out more in the colder part of the tank versus the ale yeast, it's kind of crowding up at the top of the tank. Um, and you're gonna want different size tanks and shapes of tanks for lagering and ales, um, but we will not go there today. Um, these are some big ass fermenters. Um, you probably see these at Miller's, Coors, um, well maybe not Miller anymore, see if PBR buys them. It's PBR, yeah. They, they bought them or? Yeah, they got them, 150. Million, that's it? That was it. <coughs> Cheap. We should have bought it. Right? Yeah. I could have bought that with my Calpoly salary. Um, does anybody remember here in Ballast Point selling out like two, three years ago? You guys remember the price on that one? It wasn't a million, it was a billion. They sold out for $1.2 billion for a craft brewery. Um, not much money in beer, but you can make a crap ton in beer if you do it right. Um, so these are really large fermenters probably 300 hectoliters or more. Um, it's still glycol chilled, everything's still the same, but they have it wrapped around the outside, more um, weather tech. Um, it always fascinates me when I go up to like Denver and there's snow all around and they're brewing um, and the beer is hot, it's cold, they can really control it because it's all jacketed inside there. Um, we use propylene glycol mainly to cool the tanks um, and propylene glycol is a food grade. And all of my soda extracts I make, the first ingredient or second ingredient is propylene glycol. And it's uh, flammable, so it always scares me. Um, but at a food grade, it's just basically to help um, like a coagulant for products. So that's one of the big ones. If you go over by the 210, you see those guys. Um, there's different filtrations on our finished beer. Um, I don't really do many filtrations. Uh, that's what people say, they have unfiltered beer. Um, I use a product called Biofine, which again is um, vegan friendly. If anybody's ever played uh, that Ninja Fruit game. So it's basically like doing that, you're dropping the top of your tank and it's cutting all the proteins, any yeast sediments out of solution and they'll fall to the bottom and you have a clearer product. Um, you're making lagers, you have and you want a nice clear blonde ale, um, you can use this. Um, there's other filtrations, you got um, DME, is di um, D DE, di diatomaceous earth, is another filtration system. Um, you can use other yeast and bacteria to filter it. Um, these are not really practiced too often anymore at a small craft level. Um, the bigger guys are gonna to wanna to filter out their beer. Actually, I think I have more common. So here's a picture of uh, filters, um, centrifuge. So this is what a lot of um, like medium sized craft brewers I know are starting to lean towards the centrifuge. Um, it's used, then we know what a centrifuge does. So we're putting in our beer through that cone shape and it's spinning <coughs> really fast. 
um, depending on what they're on, about 2,000 RPMs or more. So it's coming in there, and if you ever go on those carny rides where you spin around and you can fall in the back and your hair goes around and somebody barfs and it goes all over, it's basically that same thing. So they're spinning really fast, whipping out any protein, any yeast in suspension in the beer, and it's draining down. Over here, don't look too clean. Um, and it's draining down and going into the bright tank. Generally, it's getting um, carbonated from filter to the bright tank. Um, this helps increase shelf life stability because if I have all my beer, I've lab tested, still has yeast in it when you're drinking it. There's still live active yeast in all my beer because I don't do any of these kind of techniques. Um, some say there's more flavor with that, some say there's no difference. If it comes to, I'm sure Gavin can tell on his amazing palate. Um, yeah, this is about 100 grand for one of these. Um, and the, there's a lot of, not a whole lot of waste going into it, but you have to be at a certain size that you can really get efficiency. I know one of my brewers works at Golden Road. They'll put about 100 barrels through it and only lose three barrels. So is that three barrels was yeast and protein, or was that three barrels that just got, had to get rinsed through the piping? Um, so that's 97% yield. Um, that's pretty good. Versus I only make three barrels, so that's, my whole day's worth down the drain just by filtering. Um, so these are really cool devices that allow you to um, filter out beer. Um, they're fairly new to the world, um, but more um, readily available for brewers now. Um, so then after we ferment out our beer, harvest our yeast, um, we crashed it, we brought it down to basically freezing to let all that yeast kind of fall out of suspension. It's too cold for them. They're going to all want to bundle up um, because they don't want to stay warm. And it's a hostile environment for them. We are then going to transfer our fermented out beer to our bright tanks sanitarily. Um, I forgot to mention on a brew day, I really don't care about sanitization because we're going to be boiling. Everything post boil on the cold side. We want to take sanitization to the most highest level. Um, I treat it like it's a hospital in there. To any little thing that's not properly sanitized, you'll get infected. And if I'm wanting to do two different beers right after each other, I don't want to have my stout leaching into my blonde, or even vice versa, there's going to be a little um, difference there. So we take sanitization cleaning to the highest level. Um, and a lot of my students that have graduated the program and left to go to other places, They'll send me pictures or say, hey, Eric, we're doing this. Is this okay? It's like, hey, can you talk to my boss? He's uh, running hot water after we do a sandy cycle. So it's like sanitizing and then running hot water because he thinks there's a smell in the sanitizer. Um, so I told him politely to leave because he wasn't practicing best techniques. Um, and I'm waiting for a call for him this week to, to leave. Um, so after it goes from your fermenter, we're going to go to our bright tank. And this is where we can add one of the other gases, is um, carbonation or CO2. The beer has a natural carbonation level. Um, that you can call it cask at that kind of low level. There's some effervescence going on in there, but on our American beer, we want that effervescence, that tingle on our tongue. So here we're going to force carbonate into our tanks. Um, we could also put it into barrels, put um, wood chips in there. We got a picture of a carbonation stone. So here's some uh, conditioning, bright tanks, maturing tanks. Um, this is mine. This is three and a half barrels on top, three and a half down. And these are Owens over here, right? These are yours. Um, 90, 60? 60s. 60s. 60s, and this is his fermenters in the back. You can see how it's flat bottomed here. So we don't want to put as much stress on our yeast at this point. We want to Flat bottom is going to help mature and lager it better. Um, basically, in the bright tanks maturing stage, um, we're letting all the flavors kind of round out. Um, when it first goes in there, we call it green beer. It tastes good, but you want to allow it for that conditioning. Um, if you ever make soups, sauces, you make anything at home, it's edible in 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you know. You get home late, done, you got have spaghetti sauce, you let it go for that hour two and a half hours, you have a totally different product. All these flavors are coming together, they're rounding out, 
they're playing well together versus you have all these different flavors are just kind of scattered around. So all my beers are mature at least five days. Some styles need longer. Some styles like my stout, you know, I can drink it in five days, it's, it's doable. Uh, my Belgians, I like to go at least two weeks. Uh, my red ale, if I give it three weeks, I really get a nice clear red hue to it, which is kind of cool to see it over the maturing process, the color change of it. Um, and then that's when lagers, we want to give it that three to eight weeks. Um, you can go too long on lagering, people argue. Um, but I do about eight weeks of lagering. So if I finish out my beer, my Mexican lager, and by the end of this month, that'll give me two months of lagering time before I serve it in a tap room. Um, yeah, so these are bright tanks, conditioning tanks, maturing tanks. Um, here's our lagering tanks. You see how they're uh, more um, horizontal where you have a larger surface down here for the um, beer to sit on versus mine were all vertical. These are lagering tanks. The only issue with these tanks um, is cleaning. So you see how the other tanks are kind of vertical and they kind of have a little conical at the bottom. You can get liquid out. These ones kind of have a little bit, but they're still, it just drains real slowly. Um, I've seen a couple breweries that have big like 90 barrel lagering tanks and they'll have it on hydraulics and it kind of lifts up like a dump truck to let all that beer or sanitizer cleaner out and it'll drop it back down to lagering. Um, so these are really badass if you have a lagering facility. Less stress on the yeast. Um, here's some barrels. Um, you, can eat, you don't have to condition your beer, you can put it straight into barrels. Um, so this is, anybody graduating this year? So this is actually your class of, uh, class of 2020 um, beer. I make a graduation beer every year. So you can kind of have a celebration like, this is my Belgian quad of my grade. Um, when I was a student, I was graduating here, I was telling the brewers like, you gotta make this beer. Any beers, just call it class of this. It'll sell like hotcakes. Didn't listen to me. Um, so my first day I became an operation in February. We brewed a beer and we did um, barrel age, and we put a bunch of um, wood staves to kind of speed up the process. Because as you see this barrel, there's not much surface area going on. Um, what we have are called staves. Kind of looks like a, what are those uh, spiral uh, potatoes you get at like the, the fair, like on the stick, kind of like that spiral. So it has a lot more surface area. So I brewed that beer in February. Um, and we let it only age for three months. And with the um, technology of the staves, kind of cuts down barrel aging by normal. Now I do it a year, we cut it down to three months. So that was really cool to see the staves age it. Um, so you have any kind of barrel, gin, tequila, rum, bourbon, whiskey. Um, Mexican lagers and tequila barrels are really good. Um, very hard to do because you want to keep cold too, um, but mine are aged in um, bourbon barrels, and this year I think I got Bullet Rye, 51% of 30 ever get the blends, but I got Bullet Rye bourbon barrels here for you guys. So if you ever come to the brewery, they're right on display in the front, we'll be releasing it May 1st. Every year, May 1st will be a different graduation beer. It's all going to be a Belgian style quad every year, um, but these are awesome to have barrel ages. Um, Owen does some really good barrel aged beer himself. Um, won many awards for his beers for his barrel aging. Kind of get a really different complexity to the beer. It takes on the oak, um, whatever kind of wood it's made out of. Um, oak wine. Um, I'm working with South Coast Hills who does our Cal Poly Zin. So when they're done with their Zin barrels, I'm gonna be using their barrels next year believe they keep them in there for three years and I'll be doing a beer in their Zin barrels here on campus. So that's kind of that full circle of grapes. Now it's going to be used for our beer. Um, you get many different complexities you can get from barrels, um, other different storage vessels pretty much. Um, red or white one you can put it in there. Anything that gets barrel aged. Never really heard of anybody doing 
balsamic because that's in barrels. I don't think you would want to. Um, it tastes like soy sauce, which I do taste in some breweries. Um, but maybe there's a market for it. Nobody's tried it, not quite sure. Um, so this slide was off. Uh, this is a carbonation stone right here. It's supposed to be in the slide before, I apologize. Um, this is a porous stone, uh, mine are ceramic. So you're having your CO2, uh, comes from a liquid bulk tank, and then it's at below freezing, like 50 degrees Celsius, at some couple hundred PSI, and it's coming down to about 30 PSI, making it into gas, coming in through these large bubbles, and it's diffusing through very microscopical bubbles through this delicate stone here. Um, everything in beer dimension is expensive. This one is actually three hundred dollars, just for that carbonation stone. And I have ten of them, um, three grand right there. So this is where I control the carbonation, the effervescence, the tingle on your tongue. Um, stylistically, like stouts are going to be lower, so I want to make sure there's a lower amount of CO two. Lagers, blondes, we want kind of like that upper medium, and then like all my Belgian beers. I want to really roll off your tongue and kind of have that carbonic bite almost. Um, I do a Brut IPA, which is like Champagne Brut, where it's very dry, crisp, has that white wine characteristic. And on the CO2 level, it's about 3.1. So it's very carbonated, very effervescent. You can kind of, you really can feel the tingle on your tongue. The issue with being so carbonated is most draft systems can't handle that. So I get a lot of people calling me back, hey, this is nothing but foam. So I go out there and dick around with their system and show them how, or give them a special faucet to pour it. Um, so here are gas, we can really um, control that point. Um, with my students, um, I'll take the same beer, and we'll split it into two different tanks. And I'll carbonate one up to about 2.2 volumes, 2.8 on the other one, where it's supposed to be at. And we'll do blind tastings, and you can really tell how much different flavors come out with the carbonation levels there. Um, it's something that it's kind of hard to describe. You really have to taste it. Um, some, every beer has a different range. Where like my Belgian beer, it really has more banana clove esters from it. When it's highly carbonated, first one, it's about that 2-2. Two -two, very mellow and I feel like I didn't fully ferment and attenuate my beer out. So I get kind of upset at myself. But then when I get it to that carbonation level, it's back in the game there. Um, you can also, at this point, do nitrogen. So at a brewery, we have two nitrogen taps, and that beer is served also on CO2. So if you ever want to figure out the difference between nitro and CO2, come down and do a side-by-side -side comparison. And sometimes you'll double look at it and be like, there's no way at the same beer. Because they have a completely different mouthfeel <coughs> body. Um, the nitrogen is going to make it silky, smooth. Um, my stout, it kind of lowers some of the roastiness on it. Um, generally, you don't want to do an IPA on nitrogen because it's going to kill a lot of the hops. Um, now hazy IPAs are a hit, um, basically printing money right now. You want that pillow-like body, that softness. Um, so I do a double IPA, double hazy IPA, and I pump it on so much nitrogen that you can't even tell there's that there, there's so much. I mean, there's so much hops in there. When it's pumped on the nitrogen, it doesn't really kill much of it. So you're getting all that full aromatic with the extra silky smooth body of it, and that will be on in uh, May for graduation too. That's for your extra credit, and it's just like a totally different beer. Um, you never try nitrogen beer. Most are. Guinness. Um, nitrogen is not um, dissolved in the beer. It just kind of adheres to it and then falls out of solution. So when you pour it, you can see it in the glass and just falling out of solution about 10, 15 minutes. Guinness has a thing that's called a widget. So when you crack the bottle or the can, you can hear that shh. That means there's actually nitrogen released into this um, can or bottle going into the beer, diffusing to it. Um, I never drink out of a bottle or can. That is just a vessel. It's not a drinking vessel. It's a transportation vessel. Pour it into your glass, drink it properly. If you don't believe me, do them side by side. If you don't believe that, get a 
solo cup and get a nice glass, um, a nice real thin crystal glass is the way to go. Um, that's why I consume all my beers when I'm at home, being an arrogant. Um, so bottling. Um, so after our, our beer is fermented out, we need to go into packaging. Um, we've done QC on fermentation, make sure our beer hit its fermentation marks, taste, um, there's no growth that we're not looking for. Um, now it's in the bright tank, we're looking for flavor, quality, pH, um, full bodiness, and we can either put into a keg, which there's many different types of kegs, or we can just put into a bottle or cans, we're making a comeback right now, which is really cool to see. Um, canning and bottling lines can vary from very basic handgun um, to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, my device, we had an aerospace engineer and we built our own for $300 instead of spending like three grand on one. It does about 95% of the job I would like it to do, but it holds, keeps carbonation, it's sealed, and I saved $2,700. Um, when you're filling a bottle, you have a thing called counter pressure. Um, with finished beer, um, just like hops, you don't want any oxygen, light, or heat, really. So our bottle, when we're putting it up to the neck, it's gonna be full of air. So we're going to vent out all the air with CO2, and then we're gonna be filling up our bottle with beer and capping it on foam for complete beer. So this allows that top layer to be foam, um, which is carbonation. Uh, new technology now with canning. These guys are literally putting liquid nitrogen into the can, so it's dispelling all the oxygen, and you have a nitrogen level on the top of that can, which is not harmful at all to the beer. So then your shelf life of your IPA is maybe 30 to 90 days, depending on it. You know, people are getting an extra 30 days on top of that because there's no dissolved oxygen. You're getting all that aromatic on your IPA. Um, I say IPA because that's what everybody drinks right now. Um, it's the most common. Um, we had an abbreviation for the hazy IPA that's basically printing money. Um, Owen can go from his experience that it's kind of a new tech, new style, but it was old style, um, and that it's people just want it. They can't get enough of them. Um, I'm not really a fan of drinking them or really brewing them but everybody's looking for that. And as the owner, or not owner, manager, I don't necessarily brew the beers that I want. I brew the beers that you guys all want. Because in the end, it's a business. And if I'm not making the business successful, nobody's coming in and I get fired. And then I'm back into school to figure out what I want to do with my life. Um, I think I have a video here. Um, so this is kind of, Brewing in a nutshell, these are brewing videos we made for my classes. Let's see if the volume's too loud. So our grain comes in 45 kilograms, which is roughly 55 pounds. I gotta make it loud. Oh no. So this is my brewery, this is my facility. Um, as this video plays, you guys can actually see like the warp production. Um, I've covered over everything I kind of just talked about. Um, uh, um, I brought my um, cream ale with vanilla today so we get a chance to try some of that um, I'll pour that around once the video is over um, we'll drink the beer um, and we'll go over more questions on the production want to look there. for something like that nice pulverized and cracked when you find the appropriate length we'll go and tighten these two screws down and keep that consistent you want to check throughout the milling to make sure it's still milling accordingly That means your drill is starting to run dry. We don't want to run the mill dry and that also overheat the motor and it'll end up deteriorating away. Out of the mill, it'll go into your mash gun or mash cooker. There, it will mix with hot water. During that hot water mix, certain enzymes will activate and deactivate. This will cause a sugar, a breakdown of carbohydrates, 
are polysaccharides into very simple monosaccharides or very simple sugar. That hot sweet liquid is called wort, and that will go into your kettle. When it's in your kettle, it'll boil for about an hour to an hour and a half. We mash in with that malt. That, what I mean by mashing in is you fill the vessel, the mash tun, with hot water, and now we add our malted grain that's already been cracked. After we let our mash rest <coughs> for 60 minutes, we will then begin the process of underlay. This is simply moving some hot water from our kettle through our grand bypass up underneath our false bottom of our mash. This will help reawaken some proteins and starch after they have been resting. We will also begin stirring it slightly as this transfer process happens, not to agitate too much of the grain, just helping it along the process. Once we have stirred it and added a couple barrels of water, we will then stop our pump and detach our hose. Afterwards, we will attach the cap onto the top of the grand bypass, allowing more water to flow through. Once it's attached, we will then put our Vorloff arm to the top of the mash tank so we can complete our Vorloff cycle. This is simply gonna be grabbing hot wort from the bottom through our false bottom, up through our grant bypass, and through that Vorloff arm splashing along the side. This is gonna be a clarification process of the wort, running 15 to 20 minutes. Afterwards, we will spray out a grand bypass, making sure it is clear. After everything is clean, we will then fill up our reservoir in our hot liquor tank. Once our hot liquor tank is full with our reservoir for sparging, we will then hook up our external pump from the bottom of the hot liquor tank to our sparge arm. Turning on the small pump to test if there is any grain or potentially a little bit lottery. After this is okay, we will then set our dial up to five and be, we will flush the cup out a couple times to make sure there's nothing in there and pure our first wort. So this is like After more like trading my staff down, out of we room. We zero out wow. our digital refractometer using RO water so we can get a zero reading. We wanna make sure we dry out this sight glass as much as possible, see what is exactly inside of our kettle. Taking gravity samples, which is basically the sugar content as we're brewing, we want to hit our marks. Um, this grain actually, I say here, during this boiling time, the grain goes to our sheet on campus. You add your hops for several different reasons. Number one, at the beginning of the of the boil, for bitterness. In the middle, for flavor, and at the end, just for aroma. In the flavor and an aroma, you won't get much bitterness from that. Only on that 60 or 90 minute addition, or in some cases, that first word addition. So you add your hops during that boiling process. During that boiling process, everything dies, so it's pasteurized. So now it's all boiled up. There's a lot of molecules that come off of that also, a lot of DMS and some other things that happen. So it's boiled, everything's dead. Now, on the cold side, I've already cleaned and sanitized my heat exchanger and my fermenter. So my hoses going to and from the hot side are all clean and sanitized. The I've got my wort that's in my kettle, I put it through a heat exchanger. When it's going through the heat exchanger, cold water goes in one side, it comes out hot. The hot wort goes in one side, it comes out cool. And when it comes out cool is when I inject oxygen. I inject oxygen it's into the wort as it goes into the fermenter to give that yeast a breath of fresh air. Now, once it's in the fermenter, I take my yeast and inoculate my wort. This is when it becomes beer. This is when the federal government becomes very interested in doing what you do, is the moment you make beer. So we're gonna stop it there. That's kind of a short video of how we make beer down at um, the brewery. Um, and you see 20 minutes, we kind of explained the whole other process that we covered. I um, just want to show you guys kind of like a real life scenario on how we make beer. Um, how many ounces do we pour on? One, two, three. Three, three finger levels, about mm -hmm. half, half full. Glass. And then, uh, Eric, this yes. is a, a YouTube that if we can we can go online and check out. Um, I could send you the links. I don't send me the link so that these think, folks can uh, have an opportunity for me yeah. some extra credit. Yeah, I think you have to like How are we doing? be a member of the class to like, get access to it.
So this is our um, cream ale with a little bit of vanilla. Uh, we gotta get you a glass. Um, this is our Collins cream ale. We named it after um, Mr. Collins here up at the college. Um, he liked vanilla, um, so I threw a little tad bit of vanilla in here. Um, if you all want to, I'm sure Owen probably went over tasting beer. Um, the way I taste beer is first on um, visual. You're gonna look at the beer. That's 25% of your taste right there. Color, clarity. Um, next, you're going to smell it. Kind of put my nose in there and just say, hello, good morning, talk to your beer, be friendly. Because um, beer is a very sociable thing. And if it wasn't, we wouldn't really be in this industry. Um, and I'd be working in the back of the kitchen and just uh, talking to myself. Um, so next, after you smell your beer, you kind of get characteristics of what is this beer. Um, next, kind of taste it. I like to taste in a couple parts that I drink. You know, the beer, am I eating coffee, to add food? So I kind of drink and kind of swish around to cleanse my palate a little bit. I always say cheers, cheers. Come by, there's many languages, figure out how to say it, it's awesome. Um, so I visualize it here. I use um, flaked maize and oats to kind of give it that um, haze. Then we smell it, you can kind of get some of that vanilla um, bean roast off of there. Um, there's a slight um, sulfide notes to it. Um, that's a little stylistically appropriate for this cream ale. And it's a byproduct of the yeast, actually. Um, again, yeast has a lot of byproducts. Next, just take a little sip. Kind of enjoy it. You feel the effervescence, you feel the tingle on your tongue. So that controls a lot of the beer there. Um, and the next step, you can, if you want to judge it, depict how it is, or just enjoy it from there. Um, Gavin said you want to have like different hands, you want to like drink beer versus enjoying it. Um, that actually helps a lot. Something that he taught me, I never knew about. Um, so when I, if you ever see me drinking my left hand, I'm trying to be arrogant or really judge a beer there. Um, yeah, so this is our cream ale. Um, we have it on tap right now. We have a strawberry syrup and a strawberry sugar rim we're doing on this one. And it's um, just phenomenal for strawberries and cream ale. Um, when the strawberries are booming here at the farm store, um, I will get harvest from their aerop aeroponics, hydroponics, whatever system they got. And I'll make my own um, like marmalade jam, if you will, and I'll put it into like a cake dosage. And we have a strawberry cream ale. Um, so this is beer, it can be very, complex, it could be very scientific, or it can be, be all art. Um, in the end, we want to just enjoy beer. Um, it brings us together. Um, if you guys watched that, How Beer Saved the World, um, we went from nomads roaming the world to now we want to make this product, so now we're farming. Okay, we should all live together. So beer definitely has shaped the world in the last tens of thousands of years, and I see it shaping the world from here on out. Any questions on the brewing process or around the beer or where to get this beer? Do you filter your beer in the water? Or do you use kind of bottled water? Um, so we use RO water, which is reverse osmosis. We were using cow poly water. Um, if you live on campus or drink the water here, it's not really palatable. Some days it's well water, some days it's city water. And I really have to figure out by calling them up, I'd have to do a different salt profile every day. So we have an RO water, which is basically like giving an artist a blank canvas every day. Versus I started out with a canvas that has a little blue spot here, or maybe that it's down here, or maybe half of it's like black. So it's kind of varies from our Cal Poly water here. Um, I know plenty of places that brew with straight water and that have like phenomenal beer. Um, so it's all very stylistically to your water profile kind of what beers you can brew. So as we go over today, we talk about Pilsner beers. They have that water profile that brews really great Czech Pilsner. Or like Burton is really good for IPAs because it has um, calcium in it to kind of bring out the hot profile there. And that's something that you can manipulate. Something that I'm still learning on water profiles, um, but you can manipulate body, the dryness, 
to hop, but aromatic on it as well. What's the alcohol on this one? Uh, this is a 5.7%. Um, last year I was using actual vanilla beans in the fermenter. It took an extra couple weeks to extract the vanilla and I wasn't really getting much out of it. I was spending about a couple hundred bucks a batch, um, which is kind of pricey for me when I only spent like $180 on grain. Um, so I went with a vanilla extract for this year. Um, used the same company when I was in the baking world to do um, pastries and stuff. So it's a pastry grade vanilla extract. Um, kind of fools me that it's um, not necessarily too artificial or it's too real. And I put just a little bit in there so it's like a cream ale with a hint of vanilla with that softness. It's not overpowering. Um, where last year it was like a vanilla cream ale versus this year it's kind of like a cream ale with vanilla. Um, and that's kind of the beauty of beer is you kind of manipulate change kind of from year on year if you want to um, do that. And as your customers kind of want something, you've got to definitely be uh, fluid with the industry and the market. And you can't be pumping out the same thing year on year. It's, it's what you guys all come and buy. And if you've never been to the brewery, hopefully you come down. Um, I'm always there pretty much every day except Sundays, but you might catch me there on Sundays. Um, it's an open brewery facility, so you can actually see us and operations, you can see me and my staff teaching other students. Um, if you have any other questions on beer, you know, feel free to ask us, any of us. Um, there's just a little rope that separates us to the world. Um, we're more than willing to help answer any questions. Um, we've talked to Owen about maybe getting a tour together. If you guys want to come down and see the tour. Um, for those two graduating, definitely come by May 1st. Those bottles of beer go fast. Last year we sold out in two weeks. Um, I only make a very limited run, about 200 bottles of that and then we'll have it on draft as well. And then for those of you graduating next year, don't worry, we'll have another beer next year and the year after that, year after that. Next year, we're going to be doing a vertical flight of 18, 19, and 20. Um, so hang out for that. And we're having our anniversary April 11th, 25th. Should have known that before I came here. The 11th and the 25th, which is it? I don't know, there's too many, there's too many events in April. Um, you have a question back? Oh, yeah, you said uh, you can come to the brewery and uh, you know, like teaching the students there, but is that like a class or something for? Um, yeah, so I teach an assistant brewing training program and it's operated through the um, Extending University. So it's actually very nice that I have people from all walks of life. Um, I actually had a student last um, semester at Owens class here. Um, I have people of three times my age on their fifth career change, or people who want to get into a totally new industry. Um, it's a 10 hour online course and then an 80 hour internship, where you're actually working hands on. Students help me make this beer. So this is all student hands on this. Um, you're not like watching me do things, you're actually getting your hands on experience with it, which makes it actually a completely unique program in the, com in the world. Um, well, not about the world, but in the States, excuse me. Um, we'll take the world. We'll take the world. Uh, I know for sure in the States there's no program I like it. Um, but yeah, get it hands on. It's $2,500, so it's a little pricey, but uh, how much was it for, for you and this year? <laughs> yeah, for that intro level classes, um, you know, pay that twice and you're into the class. I really get to teach you hands on. It really trains my students on getting an entry level position out in the world. 85% um, success rate after they graduate you get a job in the first four weeks. Um, and they're getting jobs at like, got Bottle Logic, uh, Boomtown, Frog, Frogtown I think it's called. Um, Escape, I have one that went over to Hawaii now, one at um, Grand Canyon Brewery, um, one that just moved to Temecula. A couple guys that just went out to Taiwan to invest and open up a new brewery. One guy's in the beautiful hills of Italy trying to open up like a little B&B brewery just for fun. So I've been consulting him and waiting for when it's open to get a, a first beer and a first room with him. Um, and, and beer is uh, it's everywhere. So it's, if 
you're interested, you can talk. Could we do our beer and food pairing project at your facility? Yeah, we offer beer and we offer food. And it's, that's the uh, well, three minute drive right there. Um, it's very easy. And, have you had students do that before? I have had students do that before. I did that when I was a student here. It was very fun. I got to have, kind of how I got my job is meeting the brewer that day and, you know, funny story about getting my job. <laughs> um, when we first opened the brewery, it's a brewery on campus, why would you not want to go for a beer? Um, county classes sucked. Um, they were very long and drawn out, so I needed a beer before, before I could count. Um, had one too many, they didn't have the shuttle back in that day, wasn't going to ride my skateboard, definitely wasn't going to drive. Um, so I asked him for a job, he told me you knew a lot about a beer because I'm here every day. Um, talked to the brewer later that evening, um, came back in two weeks, started scrubbing drains. So just scrubbing drains, tanks, cleaning, that's where I got my janitor degree at the brewery. 95% um, of my job is cleaning. Um, so then, two years later, I got promoted. Um, the day I got promoted, I called up my parents, told them I missed class and I got a career out of it. Um, so kind of rubbed them on their face for missing a class for a good reason. Um, cause I really enjoyed my time here at Cal Poly. I didn't miss any classes unless I was sick. Um, I think one day I played hooky because there was like three feet of powder up in the mountains, so that was worth it. But um, the other day I missed and got a career out of it. Beer wasn't really my focus, wasn't really my passion. When I was in high school, I was the guy showing up to a party with a six pack, and everybody was there with 30 packs in their hands. Um, and it goes about just wanting to drink um, quality versus quantity. That's something that I've wanted for my whole life, um, being in the food industry. Um, I don't put crap into my body, and I don't drink it. And I wanna know what I'm drinking and what I'm eating. You know, I'm not gonna go to a fast food chain and think it's a Cheeseburger, maybe. What else is in there? You know, I'm gonna go eat somewhere nice that I know, okay, these are actually locally sourced tomatoes, or I know that this chicken didn't grow up in a little two by two cell its whole life. Um, and I know that this craft beer is made with love, sweat, and tears, versus Big Miller down there is uh, stealing tap handles from me, fellow brewers, by giving out, you know, front row tickets to baseball games or courtside seats, because um, I have billions of dollars to play with. So I want to put good things in my body that are sustainable. I'm going to put people in power in the right places. Um, and yes, definitely come down to your project and answer all your questions. Any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you, Eric.